Hey folks, it's your pal Mike Shea from SlyFlourish.com and Twitter.com slash SlyFlourish, here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy DM Prep. This is a weekly show that I do on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and then post later to YouTube. Uh, in it, I go through steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master uh, while preparing for my Sunday D&D game. In this case, I am running the game Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Um, we also talk about other things uh, related to D&D. Let me make sure my Twitch channel, everything are all going well. Yes, it's all going well. How, how grand. Let me pop up my chat window so we can chat. If you are, uh, there it is, pop out. If you are watching live on Twitch, come and say hello. Uh, it looks like Dyson is here. Hello, welcome. And uh, let's see. So we're going to jump right into the prep today because it's going to be a busy day. It is the conclusion of my um, Waterdeep Dragon Heist game. So I need to uh, think about it carefully. So in last session, if you if uh, if you have been watching the previous uh, if you've been watching the previous episode, the previous show, the I I. I modified the adventure by having the the castle lanterns. The castle lanterns are my villain. The castle lanterns acquired the stone of galore. You can look in previous episodes to figure out how they got it, but they got it. And the characters had to infiltrate the castle lantern villa to steal it. Uh, they accomplished this um, in getting involved in a whole bunch of shenanigans at the castle lanterns villa while there was a big party going on. Uh, there was also they also went down into the castle underneath the castle lanterns villa where they found a uh, temple to Asmodeus and got involved in a bunch of shenanigans there, but they ended up making an agreement with Lady Castle Lanter for the Stone of Galore uh, that they would use the gold to save the Castle Lanter children, uh, at which point they returned to um, Trollskull Manor with the Stone of Galore as they got ready to uh, use it to find the Dragons of Waterdeep. So uh, at that point, they met Jarlaxle. So Jarlaxle Bayan Ray showed up and he said, you know, your best bet is really giving me the money. And the reason why is that you can't trust Blackstaff with it. She's going to turn into a fascist if you give her half a million gold. She's going to try to take over Waterdeep. You can't give it to um, the open lord of Waterdeep because, you know, money will just disappear and it probably won't go back to the right place anyway. Um, you certainly don't want the Zenterim to, or the, Zen, the, the, the Xanathar Guild to have it. And if you keep it, everyone's going to be hunting for you. But I, on the other hand, can basically make this money go away. And when it goes away, it's the best thing. And he gave this whole explanation about how like a rift between two mages caused this gravity well that almost destroyed Menzo Baranzin. And um, you don't want the gold to be like that. So the best way is to get rid of it. Gold like that gets too much attention. You don't want it. Just give it, you know, put it in this portable hole and give it to me. And he gave them another portable hole. So they have two portable holes, one of which has bottomless and ends up in Jarlaxle's vault. And they know this. They know that if, if they pour the gold into this one hole, it just disappears. They can't get it back out again. Uh, they can't get it back out again, but they can, um, uh, and the, but the gold will be gone. A gold will go to Jarlaxle. So that, that is now a choice that is sitting in front of them. I don't know if they're going to take it. Uh, at that point, they uh, figured out from the stone where the tower was, that where the vault of the, where the, the vault of dragons is. Um, so they, uh, use the stone. They realize that the stone has some kind of sentience in it. Um, I don't think they realize that they need, that the, the stone needs to be, uh, that the stone has taken over two of the characters. It's a, a petrified abolith and it's taken over two characters. It's a whole other little subplot. A lot of subplots we're going to have to deal with today. So, cause it's, I think it's our last day. I think this is going to be our final session. Uh, they got, so they got to the thing, then Erstel Floxen, the assassin from the Zinterim, attacked them, and they killed him pretty easily. It was a little sad. They, they uh, cast hold person on him and went over and hit him with, uh, the fighter uh, hit him three times, and then three times again with um, uh, action surge. So six critical hits is <laughs> I mean, for an assassin is pretty bad. But that was fine. They killed Erstel Floxen. They were ready to get rid of that jackass. And then they went into the, the they went into the vault, and inside the vault they started walking through it. They got involved in a couple traps. Um, they made their way onto the uh, top floor, and uh, they went into a secret room. And they saw a pool, and inside that pool is a black pudding. And one of the characters got attacked by a black pudding, and that is where we ended the adventure. Was one of the characters this this black hand kind of reaching up and grabbing, uh, and you know his face burning off. Um, so that was where we ended the adventure. The characters are currently level six. 
Uh, so we will jump over to the game notes. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with the eight steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, there are links below both to the sample chapter from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, which includes the descriptions of all of the eight steps. There is also a video series. Um, and you can watch one video that does a summary of all eight steps, and then there's one video for each of the eight steps. And there's also another video that goes over the whole rest of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master uh, that describes in detail what's in the book. So if, you, if you're curious about what's in the book and you don't want to drop eight bucks, that is the um, that is the way to uh, learn a lot about what's in the book. Your best bet is, of course, buying the book. But you know, I'm biased in that opinion. Um, so uh, we are following those eight steps now, and we start with looking at the characters. So our characters include uh, Lord Anton Greycastle. Uh, he is a noble. Uh, they comes from a family of uh, uh, shipping shipping people. And uh, his uh, Zarda Zord is a rival of his, is a rival of his family's. They found out that Zarda Zord and JB Nevercott are not, in fact, Jarlaxle and Jarlaxle, the third entity, and that confused him very much. Uh, Anton also has a special lady friend named Yagra, who is a Zana, uh, Zinterim, uh, Zinterim agent, but she's a nice Zinterim agent. The, the, the Zinterim are not a villain in my. Woo! Look at that hair. Woo! Um, these interim are not a um, major antagonist in this, in my running of this. We have uh, Greek Banjo Wilkerson, uh, a tiefling bard who, um, very optimistic guy and tends to uh, leap on any new opportunities that he can, regardless of who happens to be giving it to him. He worked for Dernan at the Yawning Portal, but now he probably has enough money that he doesn't have to work there anymore. He used to sleep underneath the stairs and there was always like these sharp nails and whenever he'd wake up, he'd bang his head on one of the sharp nails. It's really, yeah, kind of a hard life. Uh, but he now has a magical uh, banjo that he plays, um, which gives him great power. Uh, we have John the Grizzled. J John is a uh, arcane cleric who deals in lore. Um, tiefling Harry Potter. Yes, Tiefling Harry Potter is probably pretty correct. Um, not as smart as Harry Potter. So, uh, John the Grizzled is an arcane dwarf. Uh, he's dirty, not real sociable, and knows a lot of things about the Nine Hells, and he knew that the Nine Hells is coming to Waterdeep. He knows that there's danger here, and he has seen that danger coming up when he, um, dealt with the Castle Lanterns. Um, he just acquired, did he acquire a set of prayer beads? He's got something. He's got some magic item now. I don't remember what magic item he has. It doesn't matter, because the final episode, they're, they're not getting any real new magic items. Uh, Aranus is a drow packed to the fiend warlock. He has a big part to play in this adventure because his patron uh, uh, is not uh, Asmodeus. It is Mephistopheles. Oh, how do you spell Mephistopheles? Oh, man. I can never spell things. Asmodeus and Mephistopheles. I was right. Look at that. Uh, and he has a rod of the pack keeper. So he found out in the last episode, uh, when he was at Trollskull Manor, that Mephistopheles will buy out the Castellanter contract if Aranus gives him three daggers with the souls of three mages in it. Um, Mephistopheles wants the souls of wizards. He thinks the souls of innocence are boring and don't really offer any power. But the the rod, the, the, the souls of wizards are powerful because you can resurrect them from the soul. And then you have powerful wizards that can help you dig in Cania uh, for crazy ass ancient hellish artifacts that Mephistopheles wants. So the problem is they know two wizards that they want to kill, but they don't have a third. So the big question is, who's the third wizard going to be? But if they give him three souls, then he will restore the three souls of the three children. Uh, and buy, he'll essentially buy out the contract between Asmodeus and um, uh, he'll buy out the contract between Asmodeus and the Castle Lanters and then bind a new contract to the Castle Lanter or bind a new contract to Aranus for these souls and then re rescue the three kids. So that is an option. That is one way that they can um, get it. And these are they they in fact, it is a dagger that he gave. Uh, so um, Mephistopheles' agent, Izakul, gave Aranus a dagger that has a little slot at the top that you can fit soul coins into. And if you fit a soul coin into it and stab a guy, it will draw the soul into the soul coin. And if he does it with three wizards, he has three soul coins. He hands this over to uh, Izakul. The children are saved and everything is fine. Um, Agarin. Um, Agarin is not going to be here for this final session. That kind of sucks. Because he is a gray hand, remember the gray hands. So we'll have to I'll have to do some sort of. He's, it's kind of a bummer when a, when a player misses last session. Um, so we'll have to uh, figure it out. And then we have Annabelle Lee, who is a wizard that works for the gray hands. The archetype is Cole from True Detective, uh, and yeah, she is an agent of the. She is an agent of the gray hands herself. She had been a uh, former. What was her? Um, uh, uh, she was formerly in. Uh,
She's a former spy inside the Castle Lanterns uh, cult ring. She'd been there for a while. So she's an undercover. She's undercover inside the Castle Lanterns cult ring. So those are the characters. You know, we have we have pushed them all into our minds. They're all there on the short-term memory part of our brains. So that when we're doing the rest of the steps, we are thinking about the characters. So our strong start. So uh, the strong start is John... It's a face full of black pudding. Pretty easy, strong start. So we're not going to worry about this too much. They are getting in a fight with a black pudding. Nothing like starting off, um, uh, starting off a, uh, uh, um, starting off an episode with getting hit in the face with a black pudding. So we're going to leave it at that. Uh, scenes are uh, crawling vault of dragons uh, facing. The dragon of the vault. The dragon's name is what? He's, there's a picture of him. I like the fact that like the dragons of Waterdeep is sort of a fake plot because the dragons are actually coins, and then it turns out there's a real dragon. Like that was pretty clever, you know. Like first you have a uh, you have a thing called uh, text editor. Shrike sixty five is uh, sublime. Uh, where is it up in my notes? Somewhere in here. I used to have a thing that said it, and I think I took it out because people stopped asking. <laughs> I gotta put it back. It's probably the most boring question because who really cares what text I'm using? Uh, sublime. But it's a nice text editor. I've been using it for a long time. There. Um, and they can all watch the video for sublime text. Boring. So, uh, dragon, uh, what's the, yeah. So I thought it was very clever that it's called, uh, uh, water deep dragon heist. And you're like, Ooh, there's a dragon involved. And then you're like, no, dragons are actually gold coins. And like, oh, and it's like, Oh, here's a dragon guarding the dragons. And you're like, yay, dragon. So I thought that was a fun switcheroo. Uh, so what is the name of the dragon? Um, Barok Claghammer uh, or Oranax. So I am going to uh, let's let's see. We'll put an NPC. Whoops, I added a secret. So I'm gonna make some modifications to uh, the, the, the plot. Um, um, so the facing the dragon, facing Arnax. Dragon of the vault. Uh, then facing uh, Victoria outside of the tower. And then the conclusion at Manor. I am packing a lot in today's uh, in today's game, and I, I think that's going to be a problem. Um, does Faceful have one L or two? I don't know. Um, so I have my scenes pretty well laid out, but that's a lot of scenes for a three hour game. These are big scenes too. One L, thank you Shrike, one L. Now I gotta go and edit uh, the strong start too. Um, it's like fistful of dollars, face full of black pudding. That'd be a great name for an adventure. I think I'll write an adventure called face full of black pudding. Um, Maybe that'll be the, the name of today's adventure. We'll call it Face Full of Black Pudding. So, uh, yeah, I'm packing a lot. I'm probably packing, it'd be a short one. Yeah. Ah, level one. Welcome to D&D. &D. Uh, John is Kane from Alien. Kane, which one was Kane? Oh, from the original Alien. Yeah. I'm, I'm listening to uh, Alien 3 on Audible, which is done by the, it's the script that William Gibson wrote for Alien 3 and stars the two actors that played Bishop and um, uh, Hicks. Uh, and it's pretty good. It's, it's better than Alien 3, the movie, I'll tell you. 
Uh, but it's it's pretty interesting and fun. Uh, oh, Snark Knight just finished that. Yeah. So it's pretty good. I'm, I'm, I got like five minutes left, but I'm enjoying it. It's really well. Nice, dramatic. It's a dramatic uh, a sort of a, what do they call that? Or an audio drama of Alien 3 with a whole new script. And I think it's pretty fantastic. The only problem I have is Ripley's not in it at all. That kind of is a bummer. That was a missed opportunity. And they have an actress who plays Ripley um, because they have her in the beginning, uh, but they didn't keep it. And I think they could have. My cats are inside of a laundry hamper fighting with each other. One is inside the hamper, one is outside the hamper. They like to fight with things between them. This is their shtick. Like, they don't like it when they're both in an open area, but they sure like to, like, have a pillar between them. So, um, yeah, I'm packing too much in today's game, and that's going to be a problem. So we'll have to, you know, I have to prepare for that. I might even mention to them, like, this one might go a little long. And maybe we'll make it a little extra and see if everybody's cool with that. Um, our next thing's the war with Tien. Okay, so now we got our secrets and clues. These are, uh, what are the, uh, secrets that are going on? So, um, one of them is that Victorio, he knows where the vault is and is waiting outside. Um, Aranax thinks the war with Tiamat is still going on. That's why he hasn't come out. Uh, the other thing about Aranax is I'm going to get rid of the whole staff thing. And he just works for De Gaulle. And he was lied to. Um, and I think that uh, Frank Dover says uh, they met Weird Al last night. That's pretty cool. I wish I met Weird Al. I bet he'd be great playing D&D. Um, cats are fighting. It's funny. So uh, I like the idea that Victoria was hired. Or not Victoria. Or Arnax was hired by DeGault Neverember to guard the dragons. Uh Uh, Aranax So, uh, what else? Hmm. Other secrets. The secrets are the hard part of uh, this prep. Uh, I think I've said it before that like of all of the uh, of all of the parts, probably the two that take the longest are coming up with your secrets and clues in your fantastic locations. And one of those you can um, get rid of or, or remove a lot of by playing a published adventure because fantastic locations in there. But secrets, secrets take time, but they are a valuable mental exercise. Uh, I think I have been people have been asking me recently. I've been on a bunch of podcasts. And um, people have been asking, like, what one tip I give. And, and write down 10 secrets and clues is my number one tip. And I like that tip. And I've gone to that because um, uh, you can, you know, a lot of advice is, like, relax and have fun. And uh, which is good advice, but, you know, not always that helpful. And, um, you know, there, there's lots of things like, go, you know, go with your ruling and go. There's a lot of good tips. But, but so I don't want to repeat other people's good tips. I want a new one. And I really feel like Secrets and Clues is, you know, one contribution I can make to this hobby. And it's the reason I wrote Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master and people are really liking it. So uh, uh, J Jason Zara says, I ran it so that R uh, RNX could be convinced that DeGault decided to trick the dragon. Yeah. Um, So I, I, I kind of like the idea that Oranax has been down in this vault and he hasn't really been paying attention to what's going on up above. And he thinks the war with Tiamat is still going on and it's his charge. And they have to be like, no, the war with Tiamat is over. And he'll... Uh... That'll be a fun one. They have to be convinced that they're not uh, dragon cultists. He thinks they're dragon cultists. Um, that, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, what else? What other cool things are going on? What other... Uh, uh, big conclusion. Who gets the gold? Options are Jarlaxle, 
Um, Blackstaff. Um, Asmodeus. Um, Gold Strife. And, um, Lariel Silverhand. Others? Could be. What are you guys doing? What are you guys doing down there? Cats are crazy. Um, yeah, I think that the, 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 the answer to this little riddle is that, uh, tricking, or not tricking Ornax, but convincing Ornax that he has already been tricked by Degault is really the way to, to get it. Now, they could end up fighting it. Uh, and I think one thing I'll do is if they fight... So he's not going to be an adult. I think we're going to make him a young. He's too powerful as an adult. CR 17. Give me a break. But if we do a young... Um, I think a young gold dragon is pretty... Uh, still powerful. I CR 10. So that's really powerful. Um... And it will use its weakening breath rather than its fire breath because it doesn't want to hurt the gold. So that way they're not getting hit by a 55-foot fire breath. Uh. I think that'll work. It's a good, powerful dragon. Um... I might give him a couple legendary resistances too. Are there any other secrets? We'll, we'll, we'll hang on to those secrets for a time. I don't think we need a whole lot. Um, the main thing is that a whole bunch of people want the gold and, and we don't want to complicate things here. Um, it's tricky. So Annabelle Lee is going to have to make a decision about what to do with the gray hands and whether she's going to choose. Oh, characters are at the hamper. No, hamper's in the center of the floor. Uh, so fantastic locations. Is really just the Vault of Dragons, and we don't really have to worry about the rest. Uh, NPCs. We're gonna we're gonna keep the most important NPCs who are likely to show up here. You have Oranax. You have Gold Strife. I'm just gonna abbreviate the name to Gold Strife. Floxen is dead. Uh, so we can knock Floxen down to the dead list. Somewhere there's a dead list. Um. Or is he? No, he was really dead. They, they beat the crap out of him. Uh, Sergeant Staggett's not really important. Yeah, these, these are mostly not important. Um, it'd be funny if Sammy the Foulmouth Unicorn showed up again. Uh, Leaf, and these are names I often forget. Leaf and Tyler Mil Milrock are, are important, so we'll stick them up top. Sarah Dirthands is around. She's probably uh, speaking on behalf of Jarlaxle. Uh, I already have that one. Um, Williford Crowley, I think he might still be alive. So I think having Williford Crowley, yeah. So the final battle here, um, Victorio, yeah. So let's do monsters are, uh, uh, Williford Crowley is a, um, doppelganger cult fanatic. Um, and Top Hat, who is a Cambion. Cambion, yeah. Um, uh, so that's really, fight-wise, we have Black Pudding. We have the Dragon. And we have Victorio Castle Enter. Um, those are our three, whoops, those are our three encounters for today. Treasure is 500,000 gold pieces. Yay. Um, the doppelganger, uh, which one? Uh, it says that's probably an hour and a, hour and a quarter to two hours worth of time right there. The dragon or the um, um, the three fights. Yeah, right. And so I have a three-hour game, and I think I'm packing. 
Um, yeah, now one thing to keep in mind is I'm running all these through the mind, and that runs a little faster. So I think we'll be okay. Um, and I'm only going to throw three villains at the end, but they're powerful villains, so they're going to have a they're going to have a strong fight. Victorio Castle Lantern is no pushover. Um, so you know, we're going to see how that goes. That's going to be their big final fight. Uh, and they have to stab him with that dagger, the soul stealing dagger. Uh, uh, so that's, you know, okay. You know, so I feel pretty good about this. I'm pretty happy. I got, you know, four secrets left if I have any more secrets, but I think this is pretty strong. Um, I'm sure things will go haywire. What's going to happen if they lose or otherwise fail? I'm probably going to be pushing heavily in their in their in their in their way. Um, I hate to do the Deus Ex Machina, uh, but it's possible that Blackstaff would show up and um, take down. You know, you you could have a couple of things like Blackstaff shows up, Castellander disappears, um, maybe Gold, maybe one of the devils, maybe the you know Jarlaxel shows up, maybe Jarlaxel's agents show up. So I could give them like NPCs that they could run, uh, where Jarlaxel kind of routes them differently. Um, so that's how it would go if it went badly. I think if they lose, but I'm probably you know i'm i'm gonna be turning the dial a little bit towards them winning i think they'll do okay they're six level there's five six level pcs uh, you know they'll have and and if, if they don't fight the dragon they're gonna be pretty they'll be pretty fine um i don't know who they want to give the gold to um yeah if they lose it it could be that like jarlaxle takes it right and and says you know well you have your yeah oh you know here's to your health and walks away with the gold um you know i think that that would be pretty would be pretty cool um yeah so those those could be options that like you know whoever saves them maybe i'll roll randomly for like who's going to save them blackstaff saves them you know maybe there's like a 50 50 shot it's either blackstaff or Jarlaxle. And his guys show up. Or maybe they both show up. And we kind of roll which one sort of comes out, you know. And then stealth checks. The goal is is uh, stealth. You know, they have to they have to roll, like, checks to see who gets the gold. That'd be kind of fun. Uh, I don't think it's going to go the way. I think they'll I think they'll do okay. Victorio. Victorio is a, a badass. Uh, let's go to our encounter tools. Encounter builder. Uh, where do I have my... Uh, where are my encounters? So how come when I go to Encounter Builder, it doesn't show me my encounters? Oh, because it's under Creations. Encounter Builder is different than my encounters. So we go Delete, Delete. So we're going to make a new encounter. And we have um, Young Gold Dragon. Bang. We have Victorio Castle Hunter. Bang. We have... Cambion, bang. We have an assassin, bang. Uh, we have a black pudding, bang. And then we hit final, final dragon heist. Save. So here is our little final list. Um, yeah, you could have Jarlaxle and Blackstaff fight. That's <sighs> really complicated. Uh, I don't think the gold dragon is mad enough to melt the gold. I think he will be breathing out the, the his anti-strength one. Um, so I think that that will be... He might do it if like things are going really badly. Uh, but they have to go really badly. So, um, yeah. So I think we're okay, though. Yeah. So I'm, I'm you know... I, that was about a half hour, right? From, from from good to from top to bottom game prep, about a half hour, and this is for about a three. But I bet you this might squeeze into a four hour game. I'm gonna ask them if they can take a little bit of extra time today, so that way, I mean that's the easiest way to say, you know, are you guys good going till four? And then you know it may not go that long, but if it does, then maybe they're okay. And that way, um, half hour per four hours is always my prep target. Yeah, Navy DM says. I, that feels right to me too. Uh, I think if, you know, I mean, you could certainly spend more time than that. I, I could build a glorious Dwarven Forge array or I could do, I don't know, a, a hand out some puzzles and stuff. You know, there's a lot of things you can do that probably have some high impact that you could fit into extra time. But 
you know, one of the things that I've been striving for when people ask me like, what's, you know, what, why do you do this? And the real reason that I have things like Return to Lazy Dungeon Master and these shows and stuff like that is because I know that a lot of people have a hard time with prep and it takes a long time. They don't really know what to do. So this is our, you know, this is what we're doing. Hello, kitty. Is you real thirsty fighting in, a ha fighting in a hamper? Thirsty work? So uh, what else? So I forgot to mention two things. One is uh, shows like this are brought to you by the fine uh, the, the the fine backers of the Sly Flourish Empire on Patreon. Uh, go to patreon.com slash slyflourish if you want to be a supporter of the website slyflourish.com and of my tweets at twitter.com slash slyflourish and the shows and the YouTube videos and stuff like that. Uh, you can you can be a supporter of the show by visiting those. Uh, and also, right now, we have a Kickstarter going on uh, for Fantastic Adventures Ruins of the Grendel Root. Uh, if you, oh, wow, a bunch of money came in. Oh, my God, look at that, more money. Oh, my, no, money went away. Um, I don't know if you guys saw that. That's pretty funny. Um, but we did well, $145 this morning. Uh, so... Uh, Fantastic Adventures Ruins of the Grendel Root is a book of 10 5th edition fantasy role-playing adventures uh, set in the endless caverns of Black, Ma Black Claw Mountain, uh, in which lies a uh, hideous alien sentience known as the Grendel Root. Uh, it is a book built around the principles of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. So uh, it is a book that intends to do the heavy lifting for you so that you have easy to run adventures to drop into your own campaign anywhere. They are all set within a mountain, but the mountain itself can be set basically anywhere. So it can fit easily in the Forgotten Realms or Midgard or anywhere you want it. Uh, they are fantasy based, so it probably won't fit well into your science fiction adventure, but I bet you could do some Numenera stuff in there. Um, we are hammering through stretch goals. I think we've crossed five stretch goals with two to go. Uh, so we have a map pack all done by uh, Elven Tower. Uh, let's show one of Elven Tower's maps. There's an Elven Tower map. So all of these maps will be available in digital form, both for player unlabeled and DM labeled, uh, and will be formatted for Roll20. Oh, I got a cough. Uh, we have a whole bunch of extra artwork by Brian Syme. Brian is the artist that does a lot of work for Kobold Press, and he is doing all of the character art in this. We're going to have about, uh, about 18 I think about 18 pieces of character art th all throughout this book. Uh, we are going to throw in an art book. So you will get a book that includes all of the artwork, including all of the maps uh, and artwork by uh, both Jack Kaiser, who did the covers of the book and also is doing location art everywhere inside the book. Um, and that art book is available to everybody digitally. And for those who back at the, uh, the, the print on demand tier, will be able to uh, order print on demand copies of the art book as well. Uh, we have character backgrounds by James Intercasso. Uh, James uh, helped put together the character portfolio for, I don't know if I link to it in here. So there is a set of pre-gen characters that we built for the original Fantastic Adventures book. We are expanding that uh, with new backgrounds designed for the uh, Ruins of the Grendel Root adventures. Uh, and the character portfolio now also includes spell sheets. So you can hand these pre-gen characters to anybody and they can just play. Everything's all set together on one sheet. Uh, they will work very nicely for this. They, I think they will also work nicely for uh, the new D&D uh, &D Encounter uh, uh, Essentials book, which does not include pre-gens. It just includes character generating. But these, if you want to have, you know, if you want to play that adventure, you want to play quickly, um, that, that sheet will work. And today, this morning, we just crossed the stretch goal to add a new chapter to the book called the Black Claw, uh, the Black Claw Explorer's Guide. And this is a, let's see, I'll pull up the update. Uh, the Black Claw Explorer's Guide is going to include, if you're familiar with the uh, Lazy DM's workbook, it includes a bunch of Lazy DM workbook style stuff uh, that is uh, built specifically for the mountains. So it includes some quick reference stuff for improvising skill checks and, and traps and hazards. Uh, it includes madness effect reference um, Probably will include that because, uh, you know, you don't want to go have to look that up in the book every time. Uh, it includes 20 ruined structures within the mountain, 20 lost chambers, 20 fantastic features, 20 environmental effects, 50 random encounters in the mountain itself. Each of them are, are, are meaty, like a couple sentences each, not just, you know, not just uh, carrion crawler. But it'd be like carrion crawlers have invaded, you know, are crawling over the skull of a dead ogre or something like that. You know, who appears to be impaled on a Grendel Root Spike. It'll be like an interesting 
thing, you know, be, if you remember, if you are familiar with the random encounters that you find in books like uh, Tomb of Annihilation or the Waterdeep uh, encounters, uh, city encounters book on DM Guild, they are, they are, those were the models that I used to build these. Uh, uh, 20 Grendel Root mutations, so you can mutate any monster with a Grendel Root feature, like it has, you know, it has weird glowing eyes and is able to cast Charm Person or something like that. Um, there are 20 additional adventure locations, so these are bigger locations that you can sort of drop into your game if you want to have a place. Uh, rules for forging Grendel Root weapons, so you can make a weapon out of Grendel Root stuff. And a relic generator that literally can generate millions of unique relics. And relics are sort of the currency inside this mountain. And they all have a power to them. So if you're familiar with the relics that are in um, the Lazy DM workbook, uh, I can show that because I think relics are awesome. Uh, they are going to be similar to that, but again, have more of a Grendel Root theme. Um, I think I'm going to redo the spell list for that too. Oops, I skipped over it. This is the Lazy DM workbook, by the way, if you have not seen it. Uh, I'm very proud of this book too. And people seem to be liking it. It is it is selling well, which makes me very happy because it was sort of a secondary book, but I think it's very useful. Where the hell are the relics? Man, I can't even find stuff in my own book. I get lost in my own museum. So there's random monsters. Yeah, so this is like general random monsters. This is not what the kind of random monsters, r random encounters you're going to find in Grenadier Root. They're going to be thicker. Yeah, so here are like random items, right? So you can roll 1 to 50 and you get a skull. And you can be an orcish, uh, rough skull that casts bane you know and that's so like huh this rough orcish skull that's empowered with a bane spell you know so with this list you can generate thousands or millions of them i think probably millions it's like 20 times 20 times 20 20 20 50 50 20 times 20 times 50 times 50 somebody in chat do the math but it's a lot uh, a lot of different random random items that you can come up with uh and I think it will be even more for Grendel Root because we have a whole, a whole secondary table of Grendel Root, Grendel Root features. So it's like you'll still have like your Dark Elven decorated, you know, your D Dark Elven decorated brooch that casts sleep, uh, but it will also have this weird Grendel Root effect. Um, oh, you can't see it! Damn it! Sorry, I'm on the wrong page. Here's, so you didn't watch me scrolling around. Uh, this is from the book. Uh, let's see what page is this. We're page 15. So this is from the book, The Lazy DM's Workbook. Uh, there should be a link to that below. And uh, if you go to Relics, which is on page 15 of that, these are random items. Uh, you are page 14, right? So you have your your origin, your condition, your item, and your spell. And uh, that one says, uh, Spencer Dad says that's a million. 20 times 20 times 50. You're going to make me do the math, aren't you? Uh, it's uh, 20 times 20, 400 times 50 times 50. You're right. It's exactly 1 million. I thought you were being sarcastic. But it looks like it's a million. So there's a million different relics you can generate with this. Um, and there's even more. I think we're adding another another 20 to that. So it's like 20 million random items you can generate using the relics for Grand Root. Something like that. Um, uh, anyway, so that's all going to be included in this new chapter. And then we have new two new chapters I'm working on right now. One is the history of Shadowreach, which is the, the big underground ruined city that sits beneath Deep Delver's Enclave, which is sort of the hub, the hub outpost in this adventure set. And uh, a, one, a 6 to 20 campaign arc. So it'll be a chapter that talks about if you want to expand the adventures from 6th level to 20th level, here is a campaign arc and a whole bunch of uh, adventure paragraphs. On Twitter today, I've been talking to uh, a bunch of my favorite adventure writers about what you need to have in a paragraph to make it a inspirational paragraph for a DM to run an adventure. So it's not, you know, it's not doing the heavy lifting for you, but it's giving you inspiration about what kind of adventure you might want to run. Uh, so we're doing a whole chapter on that, and that will be the final stretch goal uh, of the campaign. So the campaign's going very well. I'm very happy, and uh, I, if you like what I do, please give the give it a look. There is a big sample. Um, I know I'm talking. I've spent ten minutes on this, and I already wrote a whole other. Uh, this is the sample chapter, uh, or the sample preview, which is a 20-page preview uh, that includes uh, all sorts of stuff about this book, about the ruins of the Grendel Root, five secrets of the Grendel Root. What the hell is it? Number one question: Coming to Black Claw and and starting off in Deep Delver's Enclave. I have two like read aloud sections for that. A description of all ten adventures that are going to be in here. 
uh, the Grendelwood campaign arc, which is a one to five arc that you can do by chaining five of these adventures together. Uh, a whole bunch of information about how to run them, and then a sample adventure called The Call of Star Song Tower, which is a first level adventure you can run today. You can run it right now if you wanted. And it includes all of the things secrets and clues, NPCs, the origin of the tower, a strong start, uh, adventure hooks, uh, great NPC art. There's my Balin, Balin the Beardless, is my, my dwarven patron of this whole place. He's like a common NPC. Uh, the Ruins Themselves, uh, which is a bit of a dungeon crawl, a map by uh, Elven Tower is doing all of the maps for this book. So this is what the, it's a good sample of what the map looks like. Treasures and, you know, at the end of this, if you succeed, you uh, acquire the tower. It becomes your tower and you're sort of a hero of the Enclave at level two. So uh, a whole adventure, I think the adventure is about 10 pages long. It's a 5,000 word adventure and you can download it for free right now and play it and run it. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed that. Okay, sorry. That was a 13-minute pitch for all my other stuff. So what else is going on in the world of D&D? Uh, well, folks in chat, is there anything else you want to talk about? I have a couple I have a couple of topics I could talk about, but I'm always curious. The Acquisitions Incorporated book. Yes. Uh, let's see. I don't – so I'm going to be careful uh, and not show too much because I don't want to, like, spoil it. Source books. Da, da, da. Where is it? Acquisitions Incorporated. It's on D&D Beyond, by the way. Um, there's the awesome cover art. Uh, I am, so I have not bought my physical copy yet. I'm going to my game shop today, and I'm going to buy it. So uh, I have looked through it. I'm, I have not given it a real solid read yet. I'm very interested in the adventures. I'm curious to see how those adventures go, and I've heard people that are already playing them. Um, uh, Navy DM says that uh, if you are, uh, if I haven't read it yet, it's a lot of fun. So here's, um, here's what I think is really interesting about this. So I'm thinking a lot uh, these days uh, about the kinds of products that Wizards of the Coast is putting out and the kind of the direction that this hobby is taking. And I think that this is, and I told this to Teos, I sent uh, Teos Abadia. So uh, a really interesting thing about this book, something I'm very happy about, is that the uh, the three people that worked on this book, three three primary people that worked on this book, um, before uh, 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 were Sean Merwin, who's a fantastic adventure writer, writes a lot of Adventures League adventures, and he's a good friend. Teo Sabadia, also a good friend, fantastic adventure writer, and a colleague of mine on... Um, uh, Vault of the Dracolich, a, a, one of the, I think it was the first fifth edition. It was the first D&D Next adventure that, that Wizards published. And uh, Teo Sabadia, myself, and Scott Gray all worked on them. Jerry, of course, uh, and Scott Fitzgerald Gray, who is editing uh, Fantastic Adventures, Ruins of the Grendel Root. It's right there. Editing by Scott Fitzgerald Gray and uh, Layout by Scott Fitzgerald Gray. So um, I'm very happy to see their names in this book. Uh, I talked to them a little bit about it while they were working on it or not. I guess it was after they had worked on it and we were talking about it. So I was very excited to hear it was after it was announced and, and after it announced that they were working on it. Um, what I find really interesting about this book, and I think there is an underserved market for people who are watching D and D and not playing it. And I know that there is a strong drive from a lot of people, particularly those of us who play, that if you're watching D and D and not playing, you're not doing it right. And I think that's a false. I think that's a false argument. I think that people who watch D and D and don't play are just as viable to this hobby as people who do play. Um, I think that uh, it's in the you know, and the the common metaphor that everybody uses. I was at a, a party yesterday. I was at a baby shower for some gamer friends of ours, and we were talking about we were talking about it with them. Some we were talking about Critical Role. And, um, and I brought up that, that this kind of thing, that there's a bunch of people who watch that don't play. And, and they said, it's like professional sports. You know, there's lots of people who don't play football, but watch football or don't play hockey or soccer or, or, um, basketball or anything like that, but, but watch it. So why wouldn't that be the case here too? And I think that that's a, you know, that makes sense to me. And it's kind of like, it doesn't matter. Like, even though there's probably, you know, and I probably feel like, you know, it's, why don't you sit down and play? But it, you know, as, as my, my mom, uh, my mom couldn't be here today. She's at church. But she, um, I was talking to my mom about it last night. And she said that, you know, she made it real clear, which is like, it's hard to get a group, right? Like getting a group together to play d d is the hardest part of d and I write about this all the time. And I try hard to kind of like make sure that that's number one is finding and getting, getting and finding a group is the hardest part about d and And 
you don't have to do that to watch it. You just pop on Twitch or YouTube or whatever, or listen to a podcast. And there's so many ways to sort of absorb D&D now that if D&D is really your thing and you just want to enjoy a game and you really get into it and you get into the characters and you get into the players, that that's enjoyment. The other thing that I think gets lost is um, that when you are a passive audience for D&D, it's not really that much different than being a player at the table. Like a player at the table is really only taking about a sixth of the energy of the table. They don't, they, the number of times they do stuff is relatively limited, right? Like they, they're not acting all the time. So uh, the difference between that and just watching all the time is not really that different than watching your other players at the table. If you, if you enjoy, and hopefully you do, if you enjoy watching your players playing D and D, your other, your other friends playing D and D, you'll enjoy watching people play D and D online. Like it's, it's kind of that same thing. So um, let's get some more interesting character art up here. Um, so my, my point is that, A, if, if we think that the ultimate way for somebody to enjoy D&D is to play D&D and not to watch D&D, I think that that is a fallacy. And if we think that, it doesn't matter anyway because people are going to watch it anyway. I have a feeling people are now watching D&D more than playing D&D. I think we've crossed that threshold. I believe that's true. I don't really have any data. Um, but uh, uh, I bet you that's correct. And then the question is, how do you serve them? And I think a book like, is coming all around, I know, but sorry for the rant, but you're watching my show, sorry. Um, and I, I think that books like Acquisitions Incorporated are skating where the puck is going, uh, to use the, the old Wayne, overused Wayne Gretzky metaphor, that um, this could be a book that people can enjoy without playing D&D. They can just read it and look at the art and look at the character stats and remember the things that happen in the game and they can just enjoy it. And I think the, um, uh, what's the other, uh, Rick and Morty, there's a Rick and Morty D&D thing. I think that's another one where fans of D&D and fans of Rick and Morty can kind of get into the game without necessarily get, playing the game. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of power in serving products that serve people who don't play with a group. Uh, the other one, and I've promoted this now a couple of times, and I gotta go find it. Uh, whoops. Uh, on the top ten list of uh, DMs Guild products for a long time uh, are, are these guys, um, and I forget. I, I always get it wrong on who writes this stuff. Uh, Give me a sec. I'll get the author. Um, oh, come on. Death Knight Squire. Paul Bimler is the author of these. He doesn't make his name easy to find on, on, um, on it. So Paul Bimler has been writing solo D&D books. Uh, Death Knight Squire, Tyrant of Zental Keep, Citadel of the Raven, uh, The Tortured Land. I don't know that one. Uh, and he also did one for Eberron. And these are uh, solo. Let's see if I can. Can I get this over here? No. Ah, oh, damn it. Let's see if this works. Hey, look at that. Like, it's like magic. Is that showing up? Yeah, okay. Um, so it, they are solo D&D &D books. Uh, and they are written, um, they are written so that you can play them yourself. And they have a whole bunch of sort of mechanics that you wrap on top of D and D so that you can play it yourself. And I think they are fantastic. They're they're fun to play. I've I've played one myself and enjoyed it a lot. And they get you're you're playing D and D like you know you go, oh you don't have your friends and then you yes you're you're not getting you're not getting everything you get when you're with a group of four or five people, but it is a way to play D and D when you can't get a group of four or five people together. I played it. And the nice thing is like, you can also play whenever you want. So I think there's a lot of potential to sort of play D and D uh, solo. And I'd love to see more products like this. I'd love to see, and I've talked to Paul about this. I'd love to see him on Kindle because then you can play on your phone. You know, one problem is I can't play this on my phone. Um, and, uh, uh, the other thing is they still use gridded combat, and I think that there should be a better way to do combat without having a grid because I don't want to set up a grid. I'm I'm laying in bed playing D and D. I really don't want to set up a chessboard. Um, so, uh, but they're great and they're they're really cool. Navy DM says I have mixed feelings on the solo stuff. Yeah, and you know I, I'm gonna pardon me for being a, a bit of a schmuck, but your feelings don't matter. 
on this because you don't have to play them, right? And lots of people are buying them. And that's another thing. Like, I have opinions about these too. And I, you know, I have strong ones, but I'm trying to like put my opinions aside because the train is going, right? And, and like, it's, I've seen a lot of people like, I don't know, but acquisition is a corporated book. Like, oh, yeah, it's not really, you know, they're changing the canon and D&D and all stuff. It's like, it ain't about you anymore, man. You know, and not you, but it ain't about like people. And, and Critical Role, we've seen this argument with Critical Role. Like, oh, that's not D&D. That's a bunch of actors acting. And you're like, well, tough because they've got a million people watching and you don't. Um, so, th- you know, the, the train is heading in that direction. And I'm interested to see where that train goes. And none of it hurts the game because the reality is we could have a nuclear war and still play D&D. It's the only hobby. There's very few hobbies that are like that. You sure aren't playing, uh, f- you know, Fortnite uh, or whatever the new one is, the new Fortnite. Um, you know, you're not playing that if there's a nuclear war, but you can grab five people and some dice and a charred book and play D&D. So this game can last regardless of the direction it goes. Um, uh, yeah, so Navy DM says, my question is, why isn't Watsy paying Paul to make them at this point? That is a very good question. And I don't know that. I think Watsy probably move, you know, they're a company, so they move a little slow. But I, I have a feeling that that there is room for this. And this is another one where there's probably almost no ceiling to this like if you know if you wrote solo D D adventures um you know you could write hundreds of them and people will play them because they're going to get through them you know it's like playing a movie i actually started one uh as when i had some downtime and i was between projects i said well let me try writing a solo version of the adventure gloom so i took gloom from fantastic adventures and started writing a solo version based on this and i got pretty far but boy it's complicated because you got this giant map you know it's it's this crazy tree and, you know, I'm, I'm totally new to it, so I have no idea if it works. And I might go back to it, but, of course, now I'm in the middle of Fantastic Adventures. So, um, yeah, so I think, like, a, a more another interesting way would be, like, could you play... Um, and, and so there's another book that Paul came out with, uh, one of these. I think it's another one of the super popular ones. Uh, well, hang on. Let's go to 5e Game Books, because I think uh, it's probably listed there. This guy, the Solo Adventures Toolbox is a sort of open system that doesn't have a story, but is kind of the system to help you play D&D on your own. And I think it uses a whole series of like random charts and tables to help you determine, uh, you know, to help sort of build your own adventure. What I find kind of fascinating, but look, it's a platinum seller, right? Platinum seller, $15 PDF, and it's a platinum seller. So obviously people like this stuff, and I'm glad, I'm glad to see them like it. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm interested to see, I think that there's more room for this. this there's, I don't think that there's a ceiling there. Um, so, uh, yeah. And Navy DM, you know I love you, so I hope uh, you don't take my it ain't about you thing the wrong way. Because it ain't about me either, right? I'm just watching the sidelines, watching trains go roaring by. So we're all just here figuring out what's going on. And every so often I try to just like throw a dart at one of the trains while they go by and stick my little my little mark on it. Um, so one, one of the things I think is fascinating, and I, I think that this is an area to talk about, is like how do you get your mind in the right state to play D&D by yourself? You know, and, and you know, it's like if, you know, I have this dream of like, it's you and a D20 and nothing else. And you're playing a game. And then the game in your head, you're like working through, like I'm fighting two veterans and, you know, my, I'm going to attack the veteran on the left and I'm going to attack bang and I could do seven. You know, you could almost sort of, um, yeah. So Dyson says, I'm lost on how solo combat works. So in uh, the solo game books, it's essentially like there is a set AI. So if you're familiar at all with board games, like, uh, any of the D and D board games that have come out, Wrath of a Shardalon or um, the Legend of Drizzt. Was it called Legend of Drizzt? I don't know. There's an Underdark one. Um, they have they have new ones. Uh, essentially, the the you 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 kind of predetermine the AI for the monster, but it's a little like playing chess by yourself. On the you just kind of say like, if I was the mage, what would I do, right? So you you have a little bit of the DM saying I'm going to do what I'm going to do, um, and and figure that out. Um, so, uh, yes, that's cool. Anyway, enough about that. I, I think that that's cool one. Um, he's not, uh, his not your problem has a, uh, question that I wanted to talk about and I will talk about in the remaining five minutes, which is, do you have the essentials kit yet? I do not have the essentials kit yet. Um, but I have watched, uh, Enrique, newbie DM Enrique on Twitter, uh, uh twitter.com slash, uh, newbie. Yay. My friend Enrique. Um, he just put out a thread uh how do i 
how do I view his thread? I'm bad at Twitter. Because this was a reply to a reply, right? So he just put out a big thread. Um, and I can't figure out how to do the thread. I think I linked to it. Hang on. Let me go to me. Uh, uh, I tweeted about it, I think. Yeah, here we go. So here is Enrique's big thread. Uh, I'll paste this in the chat window, and I will paste this in the notes. Let me get in my notes. Uh, So I think it looks awesome. Uh, I, I, I would be very curious to hear like how they made it, like what kind of testing did they do? I heard Chris Perkins talk a lot about it. There's a big long interview with Chris Perkins about how it works. Um, it looks like it comes with a lot of great stuff. It's 25 bucks. It's a little high. I imagine that you will see discounted versions of that, but it comes with a ton of stuff like cards and maps and books and dice and DM screen. It comes with way more stuff than the starter set came with. Um, the adventures look really interesting. They are very open-ended so that like you, the whole process is that you get quests on a quest board and you decide where to go. It actually does not. And I, I I'm, I'm kind of interested and happy about this too. It doesn't really follow the Sly Flourish's lazy DM style of strong start because the, the starter set did. The starter set was like, you are going to get nailed by, uh, goblins and, and now you got to deal with goblins. So that started strong. It also started with combat. And I think that there's a kind of shift in, um, uh, I think that there's a shift in kind of getting away from just combat as the starting feature of D&D, which is something I'm not really up front with because I still start with combat all the time. Um, which somehow no one read was supposed to be a non-lethal encounter. Oh, the, the, the goblin thing? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it worked. Like the starter set's very popular. I still think it's my favorite D&D adventure um, because it's just so straight. Uh, but this is really cool. And uh, yeah, like look at the book. Like it's a big, thick adventure book. You know, big long book, and um, the other thing is, and I, I've, I think the monster list is somewhat abbreviated, and and I feel like the starter set monster list had a lot of, and I was thinking about NPCs. I don't know what NPCs are included in this book, um, and I and I think that like, um, you know. The, one thing the starter set I think did really well is like you could basically play any D and D game you wanted with the starter set that was under fifth level because the monsters that were in there were varied enough to be able to do that. This one, from the look of it, and I haven't really dug too deep, I'm a little worried that it doesn't have quite the variety of monsters that the starter set did. But I'm not really sure. I could I could be totally wrong. I'll have to look. Um, but I'm very excited about it. And then there's a the whole sidekick thing is fantastic. I'm trying to convince my wife to to play uh, a one on one game. So where we can play that. Um, but the sidekick rules are really cool. And I think you could kind of hack these sidekick rules into NPC rules. So I bet you could like add a few levels onto a veteran or add a few, you know, add some mage levels onto a goblin. These sidekick rules, I think were intended for you to be able to apply them to monsters. Um, and I think that if you think of them as sort of a loose templating system, uh, I think it's really powerful. So you could take your you know, your veteran and give them a couple extra levels of fighter. And now their hit points are, their hit points went up and now they can do, you know, now they crit on 19s and 20s and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of neat stuff in here. I really want to dig into it. I was very interested to hear that they don't really address. So, uh, so Enrique has, you know, in the past, uh, he and I have often talked about and debated gridded versus non-gridded combat. And he his original statements, and I think I could go dig them up on Twitter, were that d and 5th edition intended for there to be a grid. And I argued that, no, they don't. It just it uses fixed distances. And um, anyway, I think he's come around because he said in his reviews and stuff that um, they don't talk about the grid at all. There's no gridded maps. There's no talk about using uh, tokens or miniatures at all. The expectation is theater of the mind. Um, even though it uses distances, but it doesn't offer guidance for how to do theater of the mind. So that's pretty interesting. I think that that might, you know, from, from what Enrique showed, I'm curious how, how brand new people run that. And I think the question might be, um, do they, uh, draw it, you know, will they learn on their own to draw it out? Will they sort of come to minis on their own? Um, that, that will be, that will be interesting to me. Um, 
Varel, um, Von Corellon says you have to check out dig digital assets. Yeah, so one cool thing about the many cool, there's many, many cool things, but one additional cool thing is that it gives you 50% off the player's handbook on D&D Beyond, which is crazy, crazy. And uh, you get the adventure on D&D Beyond for free, I think. So that's really cool. Um, and uh, what other digital assets? Oh, and there's three new adventures. And the three new adventures are written by <laughs> James and Urcaso, uh, Will Doyle, and Sean Merwin. Three really awesome adventure writers. So uh, the tip suggests DMs make little grid maps for players. Yeah, I saw that. They mentioned gridded. They mentioned, I, I saw that something like they, they gridded, uh, uh, that they, they su suggest graph paper. I thought that was more for general mapping though than combat. Uh, Navy DM says it's part of the um, uh, Theater of the Mind Mafia. Here's the interesting thing. So Jeremy Crawford has said this more than once. I've heard him talk about this more than once, that the entire Wizards of the Coast design team now runs Theater of the Mind. That, and, and he mentioned... So the, 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 yeah, the, I don't know. I can't remember who he mentioned on, I think he mentioned this on camera, pretty sure. Cause I was reviewing it recently. So I think this is safe to say it was known that Chris Perkins had a huge Tupperware bin full of miniatures he'd collected over years. He apparently has been giving them away and doesn't have them anymore. And all, everybody there is running Theater of the Mind. So the Theater of the Mind Mafia is inside Watsi. And, and I'll tell you that, like, I, a lot of times people will poke me and be like, yeah, oh, you're the Theater of the Mind guy. I, that's me skating where the puck is going, right? Like, i am got minis out of, my house is exploding with them. I'm looking at a whole pile of them right there. And I love minis. And I love Dwarven Forge. I'm packing, I'm buying more Dwarven Forge right now. I'm on their Kickstarter. So I love tactical stuff. But I also love the simplicity of being able to run D&D without you know, I think that's really cool. So, uh, I, yeah, I'm not going to get in the whole theater of the mind thing. You, I've got a million, search for theater of the mind on Sly Flourish and you'll find a million articles where I talk all about it. Uh, I wrote four articles just for, for D&D Beyond. They commissioned me to write four articles about theater of the mind <laughs> on D&D Beyond. So I have written, I've said everything I need to say about theater of the mind, but I was curious how this book in particular would address it. And I still think I'm going to say this and I don't know if it's true. And if they tested it, my assumption is if you're a, if you're a group, you're going to take brand new players and you're going to drop this in front of them and test it out. Um, and uh, I'm curious if it worked, right? And if it worked, then they don't need to do anything at all. I think, a, a, you know, I still think my one page theater of the mind guidelines, something like that would be really helpful to just be like, here's how you would, you know, how do you adjudicate things like who's next to who? How do you adjudicate things like distance of stuff? How do you adjudicate spells? How do you adjudicate, you know, uh, ranges and opportunity attacks and all that stuff? There's a lot of like tactically things that if you're, if you're, if you are running theater of the mind, you have to keep in mind. And um, I, I don't know that those are well addressed, but also I think that those things might be harder for people who are used to playing on a grid. And if you're not used to playing on a grid to begin with, maybe you just don't care. So um, that's something that's hard for us vets, you know, us old timers who've been playing D&D &D for a long time, we have a lot of baggage we bring with us. And that baggage is not the baggage of new people. And that's where things like getting excited about people who watch D&D instead of play D&D. We're like, well, I've been playing 40 years. You know, I haven't, I haven't played 40 years, but I played 30 years. And, you know, that's not, uh, that's, that's where I'm coming from. Um, uh, same with the grid. Like, you know, I played third, 3.5 and 4E, which were heavy, heavy, heavy gridded stuff. I played Pathfinder, which is heavy gridded stuff. So it's like, it's hard to let go of the grid. And I, and I remember I saw a friend of mine who had played fourth for a long time and he got the starter set and he's like, I don't know what to do with this. Like, I don't know how to play it. There's no map. There's no minis. What am I supposed to do? And it's like, well, what would you do if this was the first time you ever saw it? He's like, I'd probably just talk it out or draw it on a piece of paper. I was like, that's what you do. Anyway, it is 11.06. We have run our show. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this show. It is always fun for me to do this. I love talking about D&D. I'm excited about the Essentials game. Oh, so here's a, uh, a little sneak preview. If on the assumption that we finish our Waterdeep Dragon Heist game today, which is a high assumption, then our next, this will be the last of the Waterdeep Dragon Heist uh, 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 shows. And then we will be doing a short run of game prep for Grendelrood Adventures because I'm going to run, be running about three to four of the 10 Grendelrood Adventures um, for my Sunday group as, as part of the play test. So if you want to, hopefully you, you like my stuff and hopefully you'll suffer through uh, listening to me talk about my own adventures. Um, but I think it'll be an interesting preview of what those adventures look like. And we'll be doing about four of them. So I'm, I have two different groups and I'm trying to run through uh seven of the ten because i've already played three 
I don't know. I think it's like, I think I've played three of them. Yeah, I've played three of them already and I need to play seven more. So this is for me, I want to be able to run through every one of them myself before I send them out as playtest packets to backers on Kickstarter and to people on Patreon and to other friends of mine who can then playtest them on their own. So um, yeah. Anyway, uh, have a great week. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's always a wonderful time to sit and talk about D&D. And I will see you guys next week. Next week. Next week. Uh, so uh, go have some fun and watch watch some D&D &D and play too if you like.